Hello, hello. How's everybody doing? Happy Monday. I hope you guys had a fantastic weekend. I hope you spent, some of you at least spent it with me here on LinkedIn Live when we brought in all of those wonderful guest mentors and destination CEO mentors and did such a powerful, powerful workshop. And then on Sunday, hopefully some of you joined in and did the one-on-one -on -one with me and will be joining in our July cohort. Um, you know, I know it takes some time before everybody logs in. So I really hope that you're logging in. I have a really special show today. And if you are, uh, if you're watching this, please feel free to share the link. Ask your friends to uh, join in, ask questions, because today I have such a phenomenal, phenomenal guest speaker for you. He's going to give you so much, so much knowledge and so much, uh, I want to say food for thought, things to think about, things that we've not really ever given ourselves permission to sometimes think about. So I don't want to take a lot of your time. But I hope that my videos in the last few days have, have helped you understand the power of you because this is all about you. This is all about what you bring to this beautiful world. Even though we're shut down by a virus and, you know, I mean, to be honest, if you look at the five stages of grief, the first thing was denial. What virus? How can a virus stop us? right? The whole anger, the bargaining, the depression. We've been through all of that. I mean, today is the 13th of July. 13th of March was when COVID was officially announced. 16th was when uh, lockdown happened. So, so much has happened in the past four months and we're still in that in that phase. So without further ado, I don't want to take any much, any, any more time. I want to bring in our guest speaker. I want to let him talk to all of you because today it's about you and the power of you. So let's bring in Mark Dunn. Yay. Hi, Mark. How Hello. are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm fantastic. Like I awesome. said, if I was any better, that would have to be two of me. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking out the time to um, to come on the show and to speak to these wonderful people who are struggling with a lot of emotions right now. Um, you know, perhaps they were there pre-COVID, but COVID has just made it so much more stronger. Mm -hmm. But before we get into anything, please tell me a little bit about yourself. Who is Mark Dunn and why do we love you so much? <laughs> I know why I do, but you tell us why we should. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today. It's, it's very humbling and I have a sense of gratitude and thanksgiving just to be here and, and be on this platform with you. Um, Mark Dunn is a guy who has been around for some years focusing on people and the value of people. Um, I graduated from Carleton University. Uh, with a sociology anthropology degree and moved into my first job as working as a teacher and a counselor at a private school. Uh, I did that for about five years and then I moved into the mental health profession and worked in that profession for about 10 years. Uh, and then I made a shift in the, uh, if you will, business development world. Uh, and as I made that shift, I started to get involved in businesses where I was able to do jobs as marketing, uh, fundraising, management of teams, uh, and I also did some work uh, for some about a half a year uh, working as a staffing agency business developer. So I've had a chance to be flexible in my career, as well as being able to be able to pivot as the market shifts. Um, the one thing I learned prior to becoming a professional in the workforce was that you have to be willing to pivot and be willing to shift because you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, i.e. look at COVID now. So pivoting for me is somewhat easy uh, because I know I need to do it. It's just not to get the result is where the challenge is. So it's the doing, it's the effort, it's the day-to-day -day actions. So that's kind of a little spiel about Mark Dunn and, and kind of how he's evolved and where he is today. That's fantastic. It's it's an amazing journey and you've had so many different facets, but at the end of the day, everything connected to helping people in some way, shape or form, be it, 
you know, individually or in a group or, uh, you know, with the employer. So this is uh, absolutely fantastic. And you're now into self-awareness. Mm -hmm. What is self-awareness? Well, before starting to describe that, how I got into the kind of speaking on this topic was over the last 10 years, I was always speaking, but just in on different uh, capacities or different platforms. So I've spoken to um, organizations ranging from uh, employment agencies to corporate offices uh, and corporate teams and networking companies I've been guest speakers for. So uh, speaking around self-awareness has always been uh, near and dear to my heart, and it's very authentic. Uh, to answer your question, what is self-awareness? It's a great question. Um, now more than ever, with self-awareness, you, you have to know who you are. It's not just a title. It's not just a word. Self-awareness works from a framework of uh, your unselfishness to develop who you are with your strengths, your talents, your abilities, um, the things that make you unique to become elite in order to add value, not just to the world, but to the space that you occupy. And what do I mean by that? Well, when you understand your strength base, like kind of how you evolve and kind of your principles and more importantly, maybe some of your shortcomings your failures, your disappointments, all these things that you've gone through as an individual enhances your self-awareness because they're reference points to build you up, not to break you down. You see, we've been conditioned over the years that failure or rejection or negativity um, is something that is supposed to cripple us, when in actuality, that's what brings our self-awareness out because we learn to cope with those things that we've gone through in order to become our strengths to elevate us. So what self-awareness's perspective is, is being able to draw on the qualities and the things that make um, gratitude and empathy and happiness within yourself um, important so that you don't become infected by the world's point of view of who you are, because that's where the danger lies. When you don't know who you are, the world will then determine you, your value and your worth, and they will condition you to be what they want you to be, be, and you're not going to be who you are authentically meant to be. So how do we, how do we get to know who we really are? I mean, I know we say that, you know, destination's tagline is, you are the CEO of your destiny. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if there's a lot of power in you and the, t the theme and the topic for today is the power in you. But sometimes it's so difficult when you're facing adversity to really believe that there is some power in you or any power at all. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you recognize that? What what you what should I do to feel that once again? Well, the first thing I'm gonna say is that it's very important for us to normalize adversity and challenges that we face. It's very important for us to be honest about our failures, um, our pains, our traumas. Um, it's very important to expose those things to the surface and not dig them deep within you because at some point they're going to come out. So the first step in trying to figure yourself out is understanding, doing a self audit of you as a person. It doesn't take a day or a week. It could take months because I don't know what you're dealing with. You don't know what you're going to, you know, write down or come up with because we go through life going, 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 and we're not taking time to smell the roses and pause and reflect on who we are. So now that I'm encouraging you to pause and reflect, we don't know what's going to come out of that. Like, I have no clue. So how you want to start with it is just by acknowledging the realities of your personal life, acknowledging the realities of your, ch your challenges or your struggles, um, acknowledging that you are a human being that's still alive, that you have value. Because I always say to people in my talks, if you didn't have value, you'd be in three places. You're either going to be in a hospital on your deathbed, you're going to be in jail because you broke the law because you're angry and frustrated, or you're going to be six feet underground. Those are the only three places to be. If you're not in any of those places right now as we're speaking, you have value. No matter what challenges we face, COVID, lack of a job, you still have value because everything works for its good. Everything always aligns back to where it's supposed to be. But sometimes we have to deal with the adversity and the difficulty to bring out our self-awareness. This is a self-awareness opportunity 
for every single person out there who's struggling, who feels that their life was based upon a title, a job, status, income. Those four kind of pillars were just pillars of selling you false hopes. So that when the realities of life hit like COVID-19, you are now exposed. You are now exposed for who you really are because the truth was you were fronting on the Achilles heels of what the world valued over what you valued. You didn't take what the world offered you and said it's, it's going to enhance you. You took what the world gave you and you felt that defined you. That's where the problem is. That's where people have difficulty. That's why depression is on the rise. That's why people are contemplating suicide is because they put so much value on what the world said to do that now the world stopped. They don't care about you. And now you got to care about yourself because we're seeing a high level of insecurities coming out. We're seeing a high level of unhappiness coming out. We're seeing a high level of bitterness coming out because people fear other people's judgments or they fear what the external world has to say about them if it's coming from friends or family. When you lose, you lose. Life is about losing, but life is also about gaining. And you have to get comfortable with the negative over the positive because the positive always takes care of itself. The negatives and the challenges always are the things that break us down. COVID-19 is a great example because we're all in it, including myself. I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm immune to COVID because I'm not. It's impacted me as well. But let's start off with my day. How do I start my day? Well, before I touch my feet on the ground here and wake up and stretch and do what I got to do, the first thing I say to myself is thanks. Thank you for another day. When I turn my body to the wall that I face, as I wake up, the first word I see is the word faith. Faith is right in front of me. And every time I see the word faith, I always think to myself, faith of a mustard seed. Keep on going. Keep on going. Today's another day to keep on going, right? It's another day to make an impact, to add value, to provide something to support or help someone else. And even in the aspect of COVID, my self-awareness allows me to give beyond myself because to give beyond myself is easy. What most people have a hard time doing was giving because they wanted something, which is a form of selfishness. So selfishness always loses in the end. So hence, we have a lot of people losing because <laughs> they're not being authentic. They're not being themselves. They don't know who they are. They've allowed the income to define them. They've allowed the career to define them. They've allowed the university or college degree to define them. And then when all that's stripped away from us, because it's all stripped away from us now, how much are you really worth? Are you worth the same thing as you were when you look in the mirror before those things? Or you needed those things? See, self-awareness brings everything back to you. And this opportunity that we have with COVID, this um, self-isolation, the self-isolation is meant to be brought back to you so that you can reprogram, readjust, and rebrand yourself so that when the market eventually does open up, you're not the same person that you were when you came out of it. That's self-awareness. That's keeping everything in perspective there. That's, that's so insightful. I, I could probably hear you all day long and not get tired at all because you have so much to offer. But let's address a question that's just come in for you. Sure. So are you able to read the question on the screen? So uh, how can we, uh, how can we self-aware ourselves? How can we understand that? Okay, great question. Um, first, I mentioned a little bit doing like a self-audit. Um, it's identifying strengths, weaknesses, challenges, difficulties, just like a SWOT analysis, but you want to do it on you. I think the first thing we want to always do is develop a frame, a solid framework, uh, a solid foundation. So it's like building a home. You're never going to start building a home on something weak, even though you're building upward and it's holding because eventually it's going to crash. So what we want to do with ourselves is rebuild ourselves from the roots. So we want to know what are some of the principles and values that I was raised with before I got lost in the world of everything? What were some of the things that I believed in that helped guide me through life, even though some people might not agree? Um, what are some of the things that helped me stay, on, uh, stay in my lane uh, without going too fast, too slow, but going at the pace that works for me? You see, we're all marathon runners here. 
we're not all sprinters, yet most of us will believe that we are sprinters. Um, but then as you can see with COVID, what it's done to the sprinters is that they've killed off and died because they're tired. The marathon runner, even though it's slow, they're still moving forward. So what you want to do with yourself is that you want to develop that framework, that foundation of a solid framework of who you are, what you're about, your strengths, your challenges, your difficulties, and your triggers, because you want to be honest about you. This is not meant for me to help you be honest about you. You know what's there. You're the expert of you. When I was working in mental health, that was the thing I always said to my clients was I was never going to go based upon a stack of paper that was written from 10 years ago from doctor's assessments. I said, I want to get to know you. You're the expert of you. Please take time and share with me about you. You see, it's all about working for other people. It's all about giving back to other people. But you start by giving back by letting them know that they're empowered to do more and become more. But first, before we get there, who are you? And that's the most important thing when it comes to that. Hope that helps. I'm sure it does. It's, it's so powerful. Um, you know, uh, giving yourself the permission to acknowledge yourself and then to actually put it out there and do the SWOT analysis. And as I said, that was, that is usually the first thing that we do um, in our destination CEO bootcamp is the, what are those internal and, and external blocks? Because external blocks can be easily fixed but it's the internal blocks that are holding us from success, from doing things that needs to be done. And yeah, it's, it's really interesting the way you said about COVID is it's, it's made us reflect onto who we really are. Hopefully, what are, hopefully it's helped us. Yes, make many, that insight, right? Yeah, many of us, because where we associated ourselves with the external factors, which was the, like you rightfully said, the job title, the education, the status, mm -hmm. to now as a human. Um, I read a poem uh, which was written by one of my friend's son, and he said, you know, one thing that COVID has done, that it's shown us humanity. Right, as you were saying, that everybody has been impacted. Mm -hmm. So the value of a CEO is not as much as the value of that um, of those essential workers that are selling us groceries, that are putting their lives at risk, yeah. being out there. When was the last time that we really valued them? If I can add to that as well, um, you know, the whole idea around humanity we have lost touch with humanity before COVID. It's just that COVID needed to slow us down to let us know that, but still we're forgetting it because we're seeing the racialized tension. We're starting to see other issues come about with COVID. And what that's done is not just exposed us from the level of who we are not, but it, it has also exposed us from the perspective of knowing that prior to COVID, we were doing a good job acting a role of existence in order to get something in return for ourselves yes. and when that was the way of business or the way of life then what's happened or what had happened prior to covid was it was easy for people to manipulate to use different approaches or use different things to tap into people so that they would feel this person cares when in actuality they only care for how it works for them an example yes look at the way how the cost of a post-secondary education has continuously skyrocketed eventually people were making decisions prior to covid of who was going to go to school and who isn't when school should be a right if you've earned it right yeah. but we are but we're putting ourselves in this kind of selfish mode trying to portray, portray an unselfish ideology or perspective of who we are to sell something in order to get more money. The idea of manipulation, the idea of people being taken for granted, and most importantly, the idea of people's emotions and when they share something, how people have capitalized on it in order to gain something. That was very prevalent. I've seen that even in my professional world, 
when I was working in the staffing industry and I saw it in different aspects of different ways of life where I would hear it from other people where their values and principles clash with their job and they were in conflict and they were going to work more stressed and unhappy than being happy and grateful and going to work doing what they love or doing what they enjoy because there was a clash and yes. everything that we did prior to COVID was clashing. The world then eventually said, you are no longer in control. We're taking back control. Now we're at the mercy of time. We're at the mercy of COVID and we're at the mercy of the government. We are no longer in control. The only thing we can control is the space we occupy. You're, you're most welcome, My Michael. He, this is the Michael I was talking about to you a couple of days ago. So okay. Michael Raymond, I miss you. And when I first found out that Mark worked at Yes, the first question I asked him was, do you know Michael Raymond? <laughs> <laughs> so this is my Michael Raymond, who was yeah. my boss at one point uh, in one of my previous organizations. But um, miss you, love you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, um, so that's kind of just the reality of how the world has um, kind of gone in and if you want to infected and now we're at a point where we have to remove the cancer remove the the illnesses from ourselves and reclean like kind of reclean replenish rejuvenate but that may take up to two years based upon what these experts are saying um but the truth is that's where we're at so i would be um, I would be doing an injustice if I never came with you this afternoon speaking on self-awareness in the way that I'm speaking, if I didn't see that the world needed it now, yes. more than ever, because we were never taught this before. There's no evidence showing it. There's evidence that people will go to a seminar or pay a large sum of money to listen to somebody who would be ranting and raving about concepts that they did, but there was no true human connection there. What I've done with my speaking is I've always made sure that it's coming from an authentic place where people can, where I can prick their conscience, to prick their heart, to get them to think. I'll never tell you what to do. I will always encourage you to look at option A and option B. You're the expert of you. You're in the middle. Now you decide if you want to go left or right. No judgments here. Just want to be fair to let you know here's what you have. And sometimes, um, correct me if I'm wrong, sometimes we may even know where, what our challenges are absolutely but we've grown up mm -hmm. just giving an example uh you know uh, there's somebody that uh i don't know if you've met jingir but jingir lee is another dear friend of mine that um i recently met his job developer at jbs and we're talking about life coaching mm -hmm. and uh today uh there was a post um uh, for him uh, where um, one individual was thanking him for a, a session, a coaching session he did. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and he was mentioning that we're born, we're bought up in our society to think in a certain way. So we need, for example, you know, again, uh, South Asian men mm -hmm. or most, we, from my own culture, mm -hmm. right? we're raised to think you're a guy, you're a man, and you cannot cry, mm -hmm. uh, you cannot show pain, uh, nothing can hurt you, or you know those those sexist comments oh, yeah. we call it. Mm -hmm. and so we sometimes know that you know how do I share what I'm feeling? I'm a guy, I cannot. I'm a man, I can't well, do that. Well, here's the thing: the idea of insecurities and fear. It's coming from the external aspect of fear of judgment from others. People truly fear, people get crippled by other people's thoughts about who they are, not realizing that your only competition is the person you see in the mirror every day. Culturally, that's a little different because I'll be honest, I respect culture and I respect the individual. So it, they go hand in hand. But the truth of the matter is, depending on how you're brought up and then where you're living, you have to be able to, fit, as the expert of you, it, I have no right to tell you or suggest or recommend strategies that might clash with your culture because I'm not in it with you. You are in it though. You understand that better than I do. What I would say is, okay, what's option A if it was here and what's option B and potentially what could be option C? 
if something were to be done? And then looking at those options, could we put them together to go towards you? And how would that work? Because we lack patience. We lack patience so much because we envy other people's results or we envy that there's another way that could be easier or better for us because someone has said it, read it, or heard it. We're not realizing that those type of things that we are focusing on is not who we are. Your unique path is your unique path. I'm not in that pathway with you. I'm outside of it. I can see it, but I'm not in it with you. So we have to slow down a little bit with the understanding that time is on our side, patience is a virtue, and spend a lot more time 80% knowing who you are and then give the other 20 to the rest of the world. But what most people have done is flip that. 80% goes to the world and 20% goes to them. Hence why people are bitter. Hence why people are upset. Hence why people are not happy when they come home from work. Hence why people bring home work. Hence why people are stressed about money. Hence why people are, relationships are falling apart. Hence why people are getting sicker. Hence why people are dying. It's because you've allowed the outside to be your majority when the internal is the majority and the outside is the minority. Until we get that twisted around and reversed, this is going to be a continuously uphill battle all the way going up and you're going to get tired. And when you get tired, you fall, you cut your knees, you get, you get weak. You're like making excuses. Uh, you find ways to not go to this, or you find, you know, ways to quit, or you find ways to justify a behavior, or you get recruited by people who think the same way you're thinking. And you stay in the crab in the bucket of the same thing when you have potential. And you were earlier telling me about the cage and freedom. Why don't you give us that example? And I would, I know we're almost out of time, but I would love the black book story. Okay. I'll, I'll try my best. I, I know there's a question here too. I want to honor Joel's question yes, there as well. Please. Um, so uh, first thing is the, the cage analogy. I was saying earlier before we came on live, um, I was saying that in life, sometimes we all are in a cage. Uh, right now, COVID-19 is a great example. We're in a cage of co with COVID, but all of our, our, our cage doors are open. What we're finding is, is that people are wanting to hold on to certainty, which is in the cage. But you can only jump around and fly around so much because there's only that small space you're dealing with. But what happens if you go out those doors? And now the world is there. The sky is there. Different trees are there. Different towns are there. You're going to go all over the place. You don't know who you're going to meet. You don't know what impact you're going to have. You don't know what's going to start for you. We have to almost think of ourselves that way, where we're birds in a cage where we feel stuck if we're feeling unhappy about ourselves. It's because we're stuck. The world isn't stuck because the world doesn't care. All the world cares about is that it, you make sure you pay your taxes, you're contributing, and that's it. They don't care about nothing else. They don't care if you're upset at home, your relationships falling apart. They don't care about none of that. So you got to start caring about you. And the only way to do that is by coming out of your cage and going to where life is going to flow you to, not force you to go. Right. And you got to do it without thinking about other people and what they're going to think. And with the black book analogy I was uh, talking about as well, I did a 23 week, um, if you want to call it experiment with myself when I was job hunting, just to kind of see what is A, the dynamics like, B, what are some people are like their challenges? Like, what are they facing when, it, when they do this? And then C, what, is, what are businesses looking for? So over a 23 week period, I applied for a number of jobs. It could be 10 a week, it could have been 20 a week, it could have been 30, but I wrote it down in a little black book. I tracked it down weekly, I dated it, but I would also track down the rejections that I got from those companies that didn't want me. And then I would track down the places that offered a job interview. The reason why I did that experiment is to create a reference point when doing talks like this. Um, I have evidence of where you're at, but I have evidence of doing what you're doing. I'm not somebody who's going to come here and say that I'm a superhero and I can rescue everybody. I am just like you. The only difference is I'm willing to do over a willing to make excuses. Remember, doing is not about doing 30 job or resumes and putting them out a day. Doing is doing your one or two today, three or four tomorrow, the next day, five or six, and then getting yourself in a habitual habit that brings value to your day. So you, at least you know you're making progress. You're not falling on your, your laurels of being a victim, feeling sorry for yourself, saying it's too hard, 
blaming your skin color oh i'm black or blaming my language or my 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 race my gender and using that as an excuse not to do because that's easy to do what's hard to do is picking yourself up and saying to yourself i'm gonna block out two hours of my morning from 10 to 11 and apply for five to ten jobs and then i'm gonna spend some time doing some research on what's out in the community and then have the rest of my day for myself tomorrow i'm gonna do the same thing the next day i'm gonna do the same thing until that becomes a habit where it's not hard and where you feel like you're it's adding value then you start to see value and you start developing your self-worth hence your self-awareness kicks in right so those are the two kind of things i wanted to share that um, Mina was asking and i think joel here i want to make sure i i understand you're saying to me uh uh, great insights, Mark. Thanks for sharing. Can you share how uh, have you converted self-awareness into self-actualization? Um, self, I've never actually used the term self-actualization or even looked at it that way because I've spent so many years from as far back as let's call it public school to where I am today with self-awareness. When I was going through my process of academic challenges, self-awareness helped me look at the options of what I had and then what I needed to do. So if I can quickly state it this way, I'll give you a small example of it. Um, I was basically told that I was not university material in high school. So they strategically put me into pro classes or programs that would not allow me to get into university or college after I finished high school, because they said I was good with working with my hands. So I'd be like a janitor or a general laborer or something. So they strategically took those things that I needed academically to go to the next level away from me. But then one day they had a recruiter come in from a school and I saw the name on a poster and I said, man, that, that name looks nice. I like the name of that school. So let me just go up and hear it. So I went up to the library and I, you know, that's where they had the event. And the teacher at the door said, Mr. Dunn, you're not, you're not on the list. You're not university material. You're not meant to be here. Please go to the uh, cafeteria. I said, okay, no problem. I waited till the door was shut. I snuck in the library, went to the back of the library, pulled down some books off the bookshelf, and I laid on the bookshelf listening to that school talk about the school that I like the name of. And I said to myself, at the end of that day, I said, I'm going to go to that school. I just got to find out how to get there. Long story short, um, I was rejected by every single university in Canada, uh, in Ontario, except one. And I even wrote a compassionate letter to try to get into that school. And it was at, uh, th in Thunder Bay called Lakehead University. I got into Lakehead. I did that for about a year. And prior to that year, I had wanted to still go. I had in the back of my head the school that I wanted to go to from when I was in high school. And I said, I wonder if there's a way I could transfer because I'm a mature student, if I can get into that school. And I looked at all the options. My grades weren't the best. I was like a C plus or C average person. Um, because I had some challenges academically that I didn't actually get dealt with, but I still had enough drive, ambition, and hard work ethic to get me through to stay, to keep my head above water. So I got in and I said, okay, I'm here at Lakehead. I want to get to this school. I called the school and I said, do you guys have any sports programs? They said, oh, we have football, basketball, and some other sports. And I said, hmm, I wonder, I should try football because I've never played football before in my life. And I said, let me try that one. So I called up the coach and I said, coach, hi, my name is Mark. I'd like to come to your school to try as a walk on to try out for the program. Then he said, well, you just missed our cutoff, our recruiting cutoff. Call me back in March. So that would, would have been four months down the road. So I spent four months watching football on, te on television every Sunday to learn how to play football because I never played before in my life. I don't have no reference of it. I called him back. I said, I'm Mark. He remembered. He said, okay, send me your transcripts. I sent the transcripts in. He called me back 24 hours after that. He said, here's the problem. Academically, you just missed our cutoff by 2%. I can't get you into the school, but I can have another option for you. And I said, what's that? If you come to the school as a walk-on to try out for the football team and you make the team, then we'll help you get in. But if you don't make the team, we can't get you in. So I want you guys to understand something. I'm sitting on my bed that night, not sleeping, saying to myself, do I, do I come out the cage, okay, and go all out? Or do I stay in this cage of Lakehead and not pursue the place I wanted to go to? And 24 hours it took me to make that decision. And I called the coach at 8 o'clock the next morning. I said, coach, I'll be there. He goes, I'm going to mail you some stuff. Here's some stretching, some weightlifting, some stuff you got to do. I said, no problem. Now, mind you, ladies and gentlemen, 
I've never played football before in my life, ever. And I'm going to play with men, grown men, who are going to go to the CFL or close to it. So I get to the school the following August for three weeks of training camp. I don't know how to put on equipment. I don't know anything. So I'm asking for help to do these things to help me get through. Weeks, first week goes by, there was about 170 people and 50 quit the first two days. And I'm still going. I'm in, a, I'm in a lot of pain, but I'm going because I've never done anything like this before in my life. Week two, I make it through. Now, week three is the tester week because now you're down to like six people, right? And you're in that whole week of lifting weights, you're running, you're hitting, you're doing everything. And the coach pulls me aside on the third week and says, uh, let me ask you a question. And I said, yep. He goes, you sure you never played before? I said, nope. I said, I don't, I just do what you guys tell me to do. I said, I watch TV and then I came here and then I'm just trying it. I don't know. He's like, can you do what you've been doing for the last two weeks? Can you do that again? And I said, I'll try. I'll try. Yeah. So long story short, I ended up getting through the, pro, you know, the program. I made the team and I was there. And then the next step now is like everything else in life. It's easy to get in. Let me see if you can stay in. So now staying in comes to the aspect of finishing school. So now that I'm in the school of my dreams that I, that I, I was told I was not going to be able to do, uh, I was not university material. Now I'm going to stay in. And I have to figure out a way. My, my first two years academically was tough. I was on academic probation. Things didn't go well. But I was able to get an academic assessment done and then get some tutoring to help me out. I had one of the psychiatrists, the, not psychiatrists, but educational assessment doctors say to me, uh, let me ask you a question. How did you get into school? And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, how did you get in here? I said, well, I came through the door because I had no idea what he, where he was coming from. And he said, no, how did you get in this school? I said, well, I left my room. I took a shower, put on my clothes, and I came to you. I don't know what you're, what you're asking me. He goes, no, how did you get into Carlton? I said, look, okay, look, I've been dealing with this for so long. Here's what I'm going to tell you. On these pieces of paper you have, my heart can't be measured. But if there's a problem, tell me what it is so I can fix it or get the help that I need so I can finish, right? He's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to recommend the tutor, tape record your lectures, rewrite your notes, and let's see what happens. Long story short, I spent five, five years at Carleton. I finished. My average went from a C to an A. For a person who was told not to go to university, um, there's a lot of positives in it, but long, uh, on top of that, I did graduate with my sociology and anthropology degree. I finished it, and I share that as an example because there's many others to back up why self-awareness is vital even now. You got to do more than you get, and you got to stop thinking that people are going to get it for you. You got to go take it. You got to go out and get it, and no matter what you have, if it's the naysayers, the judgments, those things you have to welcome because when you're a person who has the capabilities to do more and people see it, you're automatically a threat. You're automatically going to be seen as a threat because you're different from the norm. And when you are different, you can make a difference, but you have to be willing to go through those punches. You have to be willing to go through those people of saying, why are you doing it this way? They won't understand why you're doing it that way, but you have to do it that way because it works for you, right? There are no shortcuts in life, no matter what anybody says, there's no shortcuts because shortcuts may work for a short period of time, but they won't last the test of time. So you have to be ready, willing, and able to stay comfortable within your, your own seat and go at your own pace. You speed up when you're ready. You don't speed up because the world told you so. You speed up when you say, I'm good, I'm ready to go, I'm moving forward. Because no matter what happens in this world, when you're dead and gone on your tombstone, it's not going to have all those people's names on it. It's going to have your name, your date of birth, and the day you died. And your legacy will come from that. One of the things I've always kept in the back of my head is I would never want to go to my grave easily forgotten. So let's do something with what we have. And that's it. That is so beautiful. I'm sorry, but kind of teary right now. But you know, and Mondays are one of those days that are very emotional and motivational for me. So it is used to. Uh, Stephanie, um, I think Stephanie has a question here. I mean, sorry. Uh, tell me about your problem. I'll find. I'll find a solution. The mindset of a champion. Absolutely, absolutely, Stephanie. It is all about the mindset of a champion. You, you, you have to be solution focused now. Uh, COVID nineteen is pushing us to be more solution focused. There is an opportunity out there, but it's going to take a bit more time. 
But if you continuously dig, dig, and dig, you're going to hit the bottom and you're going to get there. So absolutely, we all have problems, including myself, many more to come. But uh, more problems just give you more opportunity to see who you really are underneath the skin. Yes. And Stephanie is one of our Destination CEO mentors. And uh, she's, she's absolutely fantastic. And everything that you're saying, she's adding on to it. So thank you so much, Stephanie, for being with us and supporting us. So I know that we are gone over time, uh, yeah. but let's, no, no, it's absolutely fantastic. And for all of the viewers that are watching this, I uh, want you to know that this is recorded on YouTube as well, um, as well as LinkedIn. If you're watching the recorded version, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, please share the video. I hope that this video will inspire you. Mark will. Mark's story and how he was able to get into Carlton um, is definitely an inspiration. And you don't, you're the only person who can stop you. You can limit yourself. You're the one that is lying to yourself if you're not living to your true potential. So before we let go, Mark, today, Mark, maybe two or three tips you want to tell our audience mm -hmm. about something that they can immediately start doing that can help them with the self-awareness and awareness piece within themselves and also to start moving forward because this is this too shall pass this this phase is just like any other phase everything happens and it becomes history so absolutely and, and we and we become a part of history we don't want to you know <laughs> be the end of history so it's good so um yeah to answer your question the first thing i would say is start your day off with gratitude um, you know, gratitude is a significantly huge aspect of my life, but it's a huge aspect of all of our lives. We just choose to exercise it or not. Um, but yes, yeah, starting off with gratitude by just getting up in the morning and realizing the roof over your head is better than what someone else is dealing with. Uh, there's someone on their deathbed taking their last breath while you're getting up brushing your teeth. Um, there's someone going down walking miles to get clean water when you, all you got to do is turn the tap and it's there. Um, gratitude is the biggest thing, number one. Uh, number two is patience. I can't, I can't emphasize more how important it is to be patient with yourself. Uh, the most dangerous thing a person can do is be impatient with themselves and become a reactive person based on their emotion because then they're not emotionally mature. They're actually immature. So it's very important for you to realize that patience is a virtue in all areas of your life, but it starts with you. So when a life challenge or difficulty hits you, you have to be able to not look at what the difficulty is, but step back for a minute, pause for a minute, reflect, be patient with yourself and understanding what's in front of you, and then start processing to go through it or deal with it. Um, and then the last point I would say is just... Um, you know what? Empathy. Empathy for people. You talked early about human connection. I believe we've been lacking that for quite some time. I believe that COVID-19 has exposed the true essence of the fact that we were never really connected as human beings. We were just faking it till we made it. Um, now, I believe empathy is so important. I've always been empathetic about people and circumstances. That's why when I answered your question and I alluded to it today around the cultural side, I didn't say it's one or the other, it was both. It's just a matter of how do you as an, as an individual cope? Because I can't, I'm not in your shoes. So I don't want to do that. But empathy around your challenge and difficulty, I can relate to, I can support you and I can encourage you. And when you look at those three components, those three basic principles, um, they can guide, guide you in any world you're in and any part of the world that you're you know surrounded in. Because no matter what happens, you know, you could be on the other side of the world right now dealing with this challenge and it's hard, but your goal is to get to a different place. You know, what's the process there? Well, it starts with you from your mind, your heart and your soul to build you up, to bring value and to shine for the world to see. Wow. Mark, I don't think we're done here, are we? <laughs> no, I don't believe so. No, no. It's, it's been like a mind spa day yeah. to day it's it's been so refreshing you know everybody's been talking about the 
job search and the, the challenges of job search and the mm-hmm. challenges of networking and this and that. But we're not really talking about why those challenges. So within us, that why are we so, why is it so difficult to just pick up the phone or to reach out to somebody? Why, do you know that human connection that we always mm-hmm. talked about that it just be, that we just missed in this digital economy and after the start of internet and specifically in the last 10 years, I must say, where everybody's so glued to their cell phones, what, what used to be memes of now, really, that's the only way of communication. Well, well I'll be honest with you. Evolution is going to happen with us or without us. The robots are coming. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that uh, getting those three principles I spoke about, those three principles cannot replace the phone. The phone is going to be here. They're going to be here. But we got to work with evolution. Yeah. Um, what do I mean by that? Uh, for example, for myself, I may be on my phone a lot, but I'm on my phone develop, you know, developing, creating, and posting content to add value to the world. I'm not putting something out there to say that I just ate a fried pickle. Like that has no value, but that's what this is used for, right? Like that's what people are saying. It's been replaced now. People don't talk at the dinner table because they're on their phone. Uh, People are watching Facebook. I get all that. I'm not against it. But remember too, prior to this digital era, there was generations prior to it that created what we see too. So there's a personal accountability and responsibility that comes from you know, baby boomers, generation X, Y, Z, up to where we are with millennials. So it's not just a group of people anymore. This is the world. This is life. This is the most powerful computer ever. This is what's going to get you through to get that job. Because if you're on the bus, you can apply for the job. If you are, you know, looking to network with someone, it's ease right at your fingertips. Remember, it's how you use the tools that we have that determines if it's valuable to you or not. Because this tool is not going away. It's not going away. And and a very important tip as we close the show today is lean on your tribe. Lean on the people that you love, that are around you, that genuinely care for you. Mm-hmm. Because there are many out there. Yep. You know, it's and it's time to find the right people. And it's like fishing. The first fish might not be the best one, but you get to throw your hook back in the water again. There's so much more. So you'll know when you when you hook the right ones. Because they're the ones gonna lift you up and bring you up. They're not gonna be pulling you down. Exactly. Find your mentor. But thank you so much, Mark. No, I can say you. that I, I can say that we're not done. But we have to do this again. Maybe in a longer session, maybe in a different session, maybe the mind spa really <laughs> needs that. Uh, mm-hmm. a little more than just a LinkedIn live session. Um, no thank you for today. We really appreciate it. I mean, from thank the you. comments and from everything you see that you've made already a huge difference amongst everybody. Mm-hmm. So that was Mondays with Mina with Mark Dunn today. Um, I hope that everybody uh, enjoyed it. If you're watching the recorded version or you feel that somebody else should really listen to some of these steps, please feel free to like, share, comment. Uh, Mark will be back with us again. I am going to be talking to him offline to plan something else. (laughs) But before I go, I want to remind you all that I come back live, well, not on LinkedIn Live, but on Zoom Live tonight with another amazing speaker and that's Laura Stumer. So if you have not registered for her sh- for her session today, it's from 6 to 7.30, please make sure you go onto Destination CEO's page and register so that you can receive the Zoom link and you can join her class. And she's going to demystify the myths of job search and networking. Thank you. This is Mina Dolwani from Destination CEO. C- CEO. CEO, wishing you all a wonderful start of this phenomenal week.